Well, Gao is um, what we call it Copenhagen's first dumpling bar. Uh, dumpling bar because we took it as a bar, not a restaurant, and a simple concept. We opened it in June 2016, so right in the middle of the summer. Dumplings. It's a type of food that's across almost every single culture around this world. It's kind of like fried chicken. You can find dumplings in some capacity across every continent. Absolutely. I think it's one of those dishes that deserves a lot more love around the world. This is a story of how two guys that met in an agency ended up becoming restaurateurs. And along the way, they took a little bit of Hong Kong and brought it to Copenhagen. So first, a little bit of background about Tim and Tim. Well, my name is Tim Hansen, and I am from Copenhagen, Denmark. My name is Tim Ho. I'm originally from Hong Kong. We met just after I came to Hong Kong about seven, eight years ago. Um, and we met at Ogilvy & Mather, which is a big American advertising company. We were working in the same team. You know, in the team we were in, it was a, it was a new sort of digital team in Ogilvy at the time. Um, so it was small but growing and we worked very closely together. So I think we partnered up on a lot of projects but also ended up going out drinking a lot and being friends outside of work. Um, so I think that naturally spun off into, I guess, wanting to do something together uh, eventually. At first glance, it doesn't seem like a big deal taking some comparatively unknown dish and flying it halfway across the world to sell it someplace new. But keep in mind, dumplings are like the next most recognizable Chinese dish after rice and noodles. But funny enough, we don't actually have a real dumpling bar in Hong Kong even. So why build one in Denmark? Actually, the idea is pretty old. We opened the restaurant six months ago, but the idea, I think we had it maybe three, maybe more than three years ago, um, on the back street in Xinguan somewhere where we were always picking up dumplings while working. And I think we, you know, Tim was already at that time coming to Copenhagen once in a while, and we were like, you know, this is, this is, a, this is fast and great, and we eat it every third day. Why isn't this in a city like Copenhagen or any other European city for that matter? So the idea is pretty old. Uh, why it all of a sudden happened is a completely different story. <laughs> Sounds pretty familiar. I recall how we could easily crush 30 dumplings each over lunch because they really are, as he described, quick, delicious, and affordable. My record's actually 50. Okay. One thing to keep in mind though, the decision to create a dining concept around dumplings wasn't purely for taste and convenience alone. There was something else there that really piqued the interest of Tim and Tim. I don't think there's anything familiar. I mean, you can always argue that it's close to pasta from Italy, which is popular in Denmark. But I think we saw it as a platform. So what we liked was it is, it's a very simple concept. It's dough wrapped around something. It was another way for us to bring you know the cultures together because, of course, we're trying to make authentic styles, but we could also open up to making types of dumplings that could have other inspiration because it's just a it's a format. I think in the practical side or business side, I think the way we saw it before when I used to go there, there were a lot of kebab places, there are a lot of you know sandwich places, and there are a lot of burger places, and that's it, right? For quick grabs. I think it's just also missing options of other healthy and light and quick options, right? Uh, so I think that's also part of the reason. I think I'd like to point out right away that if they want to bring a piece of Hong Kong food culture to another place and hope that it actually catches on, they definitely pick the right dish. I mean, Hong Kong has never really been about slow dining, especially with the really local restaurants. Now, for those who haven't been, Hong Kong does have a glitzy, modernized side to its image, being an international commercial center. But most of the local food culture revolves around, you know, tight spaces, rapid table turnover, and good and cheap eats. For sure. What Nate's referring to there is a lot of dusty old shops you'll find nestled between renovated buildings and modern skyscrapers. Now, part of the charm of these old school restaurants is their use of brightly colored tile, hard plastic utensils, and the increasingly rare neon signage. A lot of that dates back to an era between the 60s and the early 90s. For Tim and Tim, 
The idea of Gao wasn't just to cut something and then paste it in Copenhagen. It was to actually create some of the essence and then find its own identity. In Copenhagen, but I think any European city and in particular maybe in America, you see a lot of Chinese restaurants that might not represent the type of Chinese food you get here. So that was also a thing in Copenhagen. You know, no one were really doing anything modern or healthy, both with the Chinese food, but also with the Chinese aesthetics, right? Um, so it was also us wanting to bring some of that in, in a more interesting way. Now that's something that's really interesting to me. They're trying to create something unique that didn't borrow from this long established heritage of American Chinese restaurants. But to do something unique in Scandinavia, they were going to need a unique game plan. One that started with structure. So a little bit more background on Tim and Tim. They originally met in Hong Kong while working at Ogilvy, the globally recognized agency. As a small side note, Tim used to be a professional soccer player in his native Denmark. After realizing that that Ogilvy grind wasn't for them, they decided to branch out and launch their own agency, Constant. Here, they engage in creative direction, brand building, and more. And along the way, they've collected awards as the Content Marketing Agency of the Year. Having run a business in general helped. Obviously, creating something like Gao is what we do for all our clients, right? They come with a brief. Sometimes it's a restaurant, other times it's it's a campaign or a different type of brand. But it's it's always about defining the experience and even talking about the business strategy quite because the brand and the business is so connected, right? And then, you know, not being the chefs ourselves, we could think more about structure and how to set up systems and, and all that from outside instead of thinking about it from the inside. I think that was, that was a good part. And then that also had a lot of <laughs> things that challenged us. So as you could hear there, most of the business aspects already fell within their expertise. So that meant they could focus on developing this new hybrid aesthetic that combined Hong Kong and Danish elements in a way that hadn't yet been attempted. Their agency experiences and catering to clients, interestingly enough, transcend creative work into the restaurant business as well. I believe there's this definitive link between agency life and the food and beverage world. The creative director is the chef, the art directors are the sous chefs, and the front of house, well, they're the account executives. It was pretty natural for us that we wanted to mix the Hong Kong aesthetic or find elements in the Hong Kong aesthetic that we that we, we really like, but try to present it in a way that is that works in Scandinavia. So take something that's that works here, but present it in a more clean way. So for instance, we the way we've done tiling in the restaurant is very inspired by sort of a lot of urban areas of Hong Kong and the colors. But then we might have Danish design furniture, so it's it's like a it's a mix in that sense, and colors and style. Yeah, I guess it's also to find a, a balance between showing through the Hong Kong elements without trying to make it like a theme park, right? It's easy to just grab all the Hong Kong elements and put everything into one place. But it's another thing to kind of find a balance and to have a place where it's still comfortable and not so much like going through a drama stage. For Gao, I thought the challenge would be catering to a Scandinavian clientele because I'd assume that they had a more refined sense of design, but it was actually more about having a sustainable image for them. Like there's a lot of places that basically try to sell themselves as one of those old school Hong Kong cafes you talked about. And inside they're clean, but they also look pretty tacky and the food just doesn't cut it. That's why we were curious as to how they would handle the sourcing of the kitchen talent, since that's such a key component of Gao's concept. The thing about dumplings are they're fairly inexpensive to produce but they're intricate enough that it still takes years to master the technique and make them consistently. So, how did they do it? We partnered with a food consultant from Hong Kong when we launched, uh, which has been part of the recipe development from an overall perspective. And then we, um, we quite quickly hired, uh, we are pretty lucky with the people we found, but actually um, we have two, now three people on the dumpling team. Uh, two from, not from Hong Kong, but from Qingdao in northern China. And there's no way it's not going to be authentic because what we're doing is based on their family techniques, right? So after all said and done, how does a small piece of Hong Kong in the middle of Copenhagen look, you might ask? 
Well, I think the color palette, I think using cream on a certain green color and, you know, the highlight colors are colors also taken from Hong Kong, probably used differently. We use dark wood, which, you know, if you go to a, you know, a wet market and eat or, you know, you see a lot of these brown laminated round tables, very dark wood, but it's plastic, right? So we took that, we're using oak wood. Gives a different feeling, but the inspiration is, is from there. We buy most of the utensils, spoons and chopsticks and everything uh, from Shanghai Street, Hong Kong. It may seem quite obvious, but at the same time, it's, it's still uh, quite important to find something that reminds me as a Hong Kong person, what we used to use and then bring it over there. I think it's quite similar to most of the European uh, restaurants in Hong Kong where they try to bring in certain elements. And also, it was pretty obvious for us, we wanted to have a, a neon sign, right? That's a very, in Copenhagen now, like it's very typical and it's, it's like a real hipster thing and it's typically a certain aesthetic. So we wanted to bring something like a real, a proper Hong Kong neon sign, right? Now that part about the tile and the neon is a definite, but I also like how they went for the good old plastic utensils because that's what you know, you'd find in one of your neighborhood dumpling places. And Eugene, I don't know if you've seen the menu, but I had a glance and I can definitely vouch it's pretty authentic. Maybe you can explain the menu a bit. Okay, so they've kept it simple with a few types. That includes the signature Hong Kong dumplings. That's what they call them. So these are filled with cabbage and fresh ground pork. But you've also got something a little more original. They've got this fried option with five types of mushrooms, carrot, and toasted garlic. For their side dishes, they've got some pretty classic items like spicy cucumber salad and fried tofu, which are actually perfect bar dishes in their own right. They obviously serve balls of ting tao, for those unfamiliar with Ching Tao, it's kind of like a Heineken or a Budweiser, like a very mainstream mass beer in China. And lastly, for dessert, you really don't get much more Hong Kong than an eggy bubble waffle with ice cream. Whenever a new ethnic restaurant pops up in a place that is less familiar with that food, I'm always curious, what's the balance between authenticity and taste? and what the general market or the general local market is accustomed to. Finding that balance is really important if you want to be successful because you don't want to alienate customers that have never tasted your food, but you also want to make sure that you preserve some of the authenticity of it. I think one of the obvious things were understanding that Denmark has a tough winter season where it's cold and it's pretty long. And it's not just that it's cold, it's also dark, right? So if it's very dark, people don't really want to go out. So you need a different kind of pool. So I think we learned that quite quickly when it was October and we started introducing soups. So I think next winter we'll be better prepared for that. Yeah, so I totally didn't consider the seasonal factor and the lack of sunlight. And by the sounds of it, Tim and Tem are still figuring things out. But after seeing how they executed it, I totally hope this catches on because it's not just that they brought over the aesthetic and the flavors. They also kept the basic essence of dumplings by choosing to sell them in a dumpling bar and not a dumpling restaurant. So you mean by not upselling it and making it a fancy food? Basically. Like from a cultural standpoint, dumplings have always been a very down to earth dish. It's the kind of thing that families make together or when they're sold in a restaurant. There's something that's meant to be shared en masse or boxed up and taken away for a quick bite. Yep. And from the sounds of it, keeping dumplings as approachable as they are actually played into their favor in the end. I think they got it a lot faster than we thought. Actually, we thought we needed to do a bit more education through our communication of the brand. But we were pretty surprised that after we opened, it was quite quickly at full house. But we also had a lot of people saying, finally, you know, I can get dumplings, right? Well, I think Danish people, because it's a small country, we travel a lot and, you know, we try to look at other things. So a lot of people knew it. And also we do have Chinese restaurants that serve dumplings. But the point with Gao was also to take dumplings out of the traditional Chinese restaurant where maybe there's 10 page menu and, you know, you can get anything you could dream of and just take it out and make a concept that was super simple so that you could just grab it on the go. From what I saw, because, uh, you know, we were working on the ground, I was in the restaurant taking orders and cleaning the floor and everything. I think for me, Danish people are, are more experimental than many other cultures that I know of. Um, I think I, I remember one 
I think one of the first few days we opened, I was at the front taking order, and then a girl would come and say uh, and ask, uh, "Hey, I have a question." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, sure." Well, what is that? What is dumpling? <laughs> and then I was like, "Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Maybe you need to know that before <laughs> before you order." So I think I think they're comfortable to walk into a place not knowing something and try to find out. Uh, I think. Another culture like such as Hong Kong, maybe they don't have uh, as much of that culture of going and explore things without knowing certain elements. <laughs>